Hey, this is Molly. Before I introduce you to today's guest, I want to share some exciting news. My new book, Fearless at Work, is officially hitting stores on April 7th. We all have fear, but my inspiration in writing this book was to help people identify the ways that fear shows up as a blocker in their lives and to give them the tools to live more fearlessly. It's about turning the small moments in our lives into big outcomes. Fearless at Work is available for pre-order today. Get your copy now on Amazon or visit mollyfletcher.com for more information. Welcome to Game Changers with Molly Fletcher, where we take you behind the scenes with peak performers to learn what makes them tick and discover how you can apply their lessons to your life. I'm your host, Molly Fletcher. Today's guest is one of the brightest minds in sports business. With a long and accomplished career in the sports industry, Val Ackerman has made her mark as one of the few sports executives to have held leadership positions in both men's and women's sports at the college, professional, and national level and international levels. She currently serves as the commissioner of the Big East Conference. She was the first president of the WNBA, guiding the league to a much heralded launch in 1997 and is the past president of USA Basketball, which oversees the U.S. men's and women's Olympic basketball program. Did I mention she also was a three-time captain of the University of Virginia's basketball team and has a law degree from UCLA? Today, we are talking about leading amid the changing landscape of college sports, what it takes to launch a brand, her close relationship with mentor David Stern, and the unexpected lessons learned along the wild ride. Please welcome Val Ackerman. All right, so Val Ackerman, well, how the Commissioner of the Big East, it is an honor to have you on. I can't thank you enough. You're a busy lady for taking a minute. Thank you so much. Great when, to be here, Molly. Thank you. Well, you are, uh, you're kind. So, you know, when you came on board the Big East, it, it was a sort of essentially a startup, right? You had new staff, new office, you know, it sort of new everything, right? How did you approach that? Uh, it was it was frankly drinking out of a fire hose. Um, the, the good news is we had a good name, the Big East name, um, known to many, if not all, in basketball as a uh, prominent men's basketball, especially, but also women, women's basketball um, conference. Um, the presidents who hired me um, before I was hired had laid the foundation with the um, the name, as I mentioned, getting that from the old league. Um, forging a new agreement with Fox Sports for television, securing the rights to put the men's basketball tournament in the garden, um, and, you know, a few other sort of core pillars, but the, to your point, um, bringing that all to life was, was left to me and to the staff that I wound up bringing on board, and it was really challenging. Um, we, we needed to recreate all of the office infrastructure with um, the people, with office space, you know, with simple things or seemingly simple things like websites and email accounts and benefits plans. None uh -huh. of that was in place. So uh, while I'd been involved very intensely in another type of startup with the WNBA, um, this was very different and very difficult, frankly. Um, but we got it done. I was able to bring on board in pretty short order um, some really great people who, you know, made a leap of faith to, to join the staff in this sort of period of chaos. And, um, you know, we did what we had to do. And I would say it was really the better part of a year plus that these sort of infrastructure steps had to be taken. So it was sort of protracted. But the good news now, um, three and a half years later, is we're in great shape on all that. And now we can really look forward to, you know, doing what our, our presidents had hoped for with this group of schools now together. God, well, it's such a tribute to you. And I know as a, as a female in sports, I've, I've always admired the work that you've done. And you know, you, you pave the way in so many regards for, for women, and then by taking on this challenge, you've, you've done it at such a high level. So thank you for what you do, certainly. Um, you know, Val, the college landscape is, is changing, right, in, in big ways. Um, how do you approach leading through this change? Well, um, to your point, Molly, when I took over uh, at the Big East, it was on the cusp of what turned out to be a major governance restructuring at the NCAA. Um, 
most notably the five biggest football conferences, um, were looking to acquire um, sort of new rights to pass legislation that they thought would be important, particularly as it relates to student athletes, um, without the need, with bo boys, but without the, the need to acquire votes from the other 27 conferences. And this um, status that they have now is called um, autonomy. And that was all being negotiated when I took over at the Big E. So I was sort of pulled into some of the discussions about that among the 27 in particular and what that was going to look like for us, um, all with an eye to keeping these 32 conferences in Division One, but with this new um, way of doing things. And so... Um, to your point, it was um, kind of a, a you know a bit of a, a turbulent time as that was being worked out, and that was on the heels of um, conference realignment, um, right. you know, of, a, of an extraordinary level. That of course led to the Big East being the composition it has today. So that was all kind of in the landscape um, when I took this role, and so I have been involved in sort of all, all manner of that. Um, not only you know within the Big East and how that's affected our group of schools, we now have ten, and how we do things, but also within the NCAA at large. Um, I would just say, in terms of how this all gets um, sort of attacked um, from a, a working standpoint, it is you know ideally collaborative. I mean, I think you need a high level of communication to work out issues, um, make sure people. Um, are, are in on decisions if that can be done. Of course, you want to have as many uh, voices involved as you can uh, without having the process be too slowed down. Right. Um, and, and that sometimes I find in this space um, it, it can be an issue. I came out of a pro sports environment, which was frankly much nimbler in terms of taking ideas to reality. Mm -hmm. it tends to be a bit slower in the college space. Um, but I, I think that, you know, the punchline here is it's all about people, their relationships with each other, maintaining a level of trust, and then kind of just having a, you know, a methodical way of getting to the end line so that you can actually get things done. Right. It, are, are there any things that you do daily or weekly from a scheduling or sort of ritual perspective with your staff when things are moving that quickly and there's so much change? I, I'm sure our listeners would love to know some of the things that maybe you do to try to to try to systematize, if you will, that process. Sure. Well, our conference office staff at the Big East um, is about 20 people. Um, that kind of puts us in the in the mid range of, of conference offices in terms of size. Some of the um, smaller conferences are smaller in terms of their office staff. The larger conferences, the big football conferences, have uh, probably significantly more people because they're managing football. In some cases, they have um, networks. That they also have invested in and have to and have to run in conjunction with partners. So we're kind of in the middle. So, but 20 isn't a lot. So that enables us to have uh, pr pretty good daily communication. I can just wander into people's offices and ask questions, and and we move things that way. We have staff meetings. Um, I have a full staff meeting um, regularly. We have what I call a senior staff meeting, which is um, another subset that I, I think is important to engage so we can get into things that maybe we don't need all of the staff to be in on. Um, we have regular calls with our athletics directors. Um, they're either um, conference calls or in-person meetings. They happen at least once a month with our group of 10 schools. I have um, board meetings. The Big East Board of Directors is made up of the presidents of our 10 schools. They meet three times a year twice in joint session with the ADs and then once a year by themselves. Um, I have other combinations of, of uh, constituents within the conference that meet most notably our, our basketball coaches, men and women, meet with uh, our conference staff and the ADs and SWA senior women administrators once a year. That happens in the spring. So we have all con kinds of combinations here <laughs> of gatherings. Sure. And then when it's not meeting, um, or when it's not conference calls, or when it's not, in the case of my staff, wandering in and out of people's offices. It's just, you know, our, our culture generally very heavily reliant on electronic communication. I mean, gone are the days where you get letters or memos and, in the in No the question. It's all email. And I think I'll just sort of close this point by saying that that is the hardest part, I think, of my job, is just keeping up with inbox management, 
with all of the emails I, I get every day. Calendar management is very tough because of these meetings, because of travel, very intensive travel business in college sports. Right. You know, we have 22 sports, sports we sponsor at the Big East, and I, I try to get to as many of our conference championships as I can, and they're all, of course, off-site. So that, that work of managing calendar, inbox, um, and then sort of the day-to-day, -day, plus trying to look ahead and foresee things that are coming down the road um, make for busy days. Sure. Yeah, and I bet, you know, um, I hear so much from great leaders that, you know, they'll, they'll have to sort of start the day a couple hours before everybody else so they can manage the calendar and the emails and get out ahead of it, yeah. right? No, no, no question. And I've had to alter my kind of, you know, daily life um, for that, you know, for that reason. I mean, I tend to fall asleep on the early side as I've gotten older, um, <laughs> you know, hey, but girl, I get up I am early. Right there but I get with up you. early. Yeah, and I, I just sort of get up and jump out of bed and, um, you know, I, I mean, I'm sort of emailing from anywhere I am. Um, the New York City subway system now has Wi Fi, so that's helpful. Can knock some things out on the way to work. Um, but it's a lot of still old fashioned list making, um, making, you know, crossing things off, doing a new list. Um, everybody has, I think, their way of time management and task management. And I'm probably a little bit old-fashioned in that score, not quite as adept on my um, personal device as others. But I think having a high level, level of energy is, is an unquestionably important if you're, if you're trying to get all of this done in the time that you have. Well, yeah, I want to talk about when you were an athlete. I know um, there's some great stuff there. But first, I wanted to ask you, you know, the, the WNBA launched in 97, and you were the league's first president, which is a pretty cool, obviously, accomplishment. Looking back, you know, at that, what are and, and and other things that you've accomplished in your life? What what would you say you're most proud of? And also, I think, what were some of your biggest challenges as you continue to evolve in your career? Well, I would I would put being part of the launch of the WNBA um, at or, at or near the top. Um, you know, the groundwork for that was being quietly laid um, probably two years before the league launch as the center of that. Um, we had a great leader at the NBA, David Stern, who wanted that league to happen, um, got the owners to support that, which was critical. Um, so, and the timing was great because at that point um, in the early 90s, women's college basketball was cresting. UConn was, uh, had emerged uh, right. as a, a powerhouse. That caught the attention of the Northeast media, particularly ESPN. The women's Final Four was gaining attraction. Um, we were studying the participation numbers for girls who were playing basketball. So, and then we had the Olympics in Atlanta in '96, which was literally our launch pad. And we were we were behind. We the NBA were behind the USA women's team that toured the year before, um, and then of course went on to win gold um, at that Summer Games. So we were in on all of that, and we're sort of quietly, as I said, laying the groundwork for the WNBA. So by the time the league launched, we were sort of already two years into the women's basketball business. Um, right. And it was very satisfying to see it um, be so well received early on. We had much bigger crowds than we expected, and, and I think the, you know, the women's side of it, not just the sports side, but the women's side of it was really powerful. And, and we were proud of what that seemed to lead to with women's soccer, women's World Cup in 99. And now being a commissioner, I'm seeing the great growth of volleyball and lacrosse and other women's sports that were really much, much smaller 20 years ago. So that's been, I think, an outcome of what's happened at the pro level. Um, so, you know, being part of the WNBA, I'd say right, right at the top of the list. But I've been lucky because after I left the league, I, I was sort of tired and needed a break and then was able to get involved in teaching and um, consulting work and being on a number of boards um, and, and sort of all in. That kind of, I think, opened a pathway for me to eventually become the Big East Commissioner. And now to be part of what's happening in college sports, um, I, I would put right up there, too, to honor to be in this role. I think so much more can be done, hopefully will be done, in terms of women in leadership positions across the board. Um, I served as the U.S. representative to the International Basketball Federation for eight years, and while that was a 
tremendous experience. Um, what's happening globally with women in sports is is disturbing. I mean, right. the participation is good, but the leadership is not. And I, I'd say if I if I remain on a crusade about women in leadership in sports, it's there because wow. of <clears throat> how slowly things are moving within the IOC and with the international federations that they rely on to. Um, to you know, manage Olympic competition and what happens below that. So, um, I think there's you know still work to be done. Hopefully, I can still help there. But overall, I've just been you know really lucky to have been involved in so many levels of the sport, particularly the game of basketball, the game I played. Right. So to be able to work in the business has been um, has been really really rewarding. What do you think, Val? I mean, it's neat to hear you say that, right? What do you think are some of the biggest gaps that need to be closed for women's sports to be where you want them to be? It's really audience development. I mean, um, you know, at the, at the collegiate level, Title IX has contributed. Um, it's not been the defining factor to open up doors for women to play sports at the high school and collegiate levels. That, in turn, has produced a generation of women like me, because I played sports in college, who've gone on to work not only in sports but in other business, um, political, legal, you name it. Right, right. Um, there have been surveys done on the high percentage of women in C-suites who played high school or college sports. There's a correlation. Right, no question. So that has been a real positive outcome uh, of Title IX, and the good news is that's sort of a fact of life now, that young girls play sports. At the pro level, I, I would say that's where you know women and men are still really different. I mean, and that's a function of revenue, largely. I mean... The reason WNBA players don't get paid what NBA players do is because the WNBA's revenues are a fraction of what the NBA is bringing in. Right. From television, sponsorship, licensing, ticket sales, most of all. And so until that revenue gap closes, you're going to see disparities there in player salaries. It's just, it's just a direct connection. Right. So then you get to, well, how do you close that revenue gap? And that's then that, that gets you into these hard business areas like, well, what's the viewership during a game? Because if it's high, then you're going to get sponsors who want to pay a certain amount of dollars for commercials because they're going to reach a lot of people. Uh, what are ticket sales looking like? Well, are there, is there demand? And if so, that will result in more tickets sold and or better pricing that increases revenue. <laughs> you know, right. Corporate America has to be involved and, and the value of the sponsorship would be a factor of how much interest they see. So all of these things, these are the hard things that have to be done for women's sports, whether it's WNBA, women's pro soccer, um, you know, what could be coming down the line with other women's pro outlets. Maybe someday there could be a WNHL if women's hockey continues to grow wow, and NHL yeah. takes that level of interest. But that's it. It's the marketplace challenges that I have seen <clears throat> where um, work remains. Right. And then the second piece, as I said, is just you know getting more women in leadership positions at the highest levels of sports organizations across the board, uh, men's and women's alike. Sure. Well, you are um, helping to lead the way with that, which is um, just awesome. So we need more Val Ackermans is what we need. <laughs> You're kind. You <laughs> yeah, you worked closely with, obviously, with David Stern. Um, what are some of the things that you learned from him? Um, D David was um, just, I mean, an extraordinary leader, um, brilliant, um, intellectually curious, um, was learning things about the technology space before it became must-know, you know, for right. people. Everybody in the business now has to know about that. He was tracking on that early. He, of course, saw the future of women's sports with the WNBA and, and his desire to make that happen. Internationally, um, he capitalized, <clears throat> I think, on things that were in motion with particularly um, FIBA's decision in 1989 to allow pro players in the Olympics. That opened a, an amazingly big door sure. for NBA players to get a platform that's pretty much unmatchable the olympics and that in turn led to other um, business uh, opportunities for the nba that david seized upon so to be at his um, side for a lot of that i was his special first special assistant um you know to this day he's a mentor i i'm in communication with him often 
Um, and I, I would say, you know, he just taught me the, the business. I mean, the scope of it, the need to be um, not just a jack of all, but a master of all. Right, right, he sure. Had very high standards on involvement. And, and, and most importantly, his focus on detail because that often trips, trips you up. Leaders have to think big picture, but you can't do it at the expense of, of details. If you're not doing them, you need good people around you to sweat the details. <laughs> David was both. He sweated the details, and then he had good, good people to work on those elements while he was still thinking big picture. So um, it was a great experience for me, and I was very lucky because I think any, any leader looks up to other leaders and needs to be mentored at some stage in their career, and for me, David was a, a big mentor. I had others, Russ Granick, the longtime deputy commissioner. Um, there were there were others, but I, I would say, uh, and I would say those two more than either. But uh, David looms large in my career. What when you think about uh, words to describe him as a leader? Like if you had to pick two to three words to describe him as a leader, the way he behaved or thought, wh wh what do you think those words would be? Um, energetic, um, tireless. Um, demanding. Nice. I, okay. I would say would be my top three. Sure. And you know um, what's cool is he, it sounds like what I'm hearing you say is he was demanding, but yet you loved him. I mean, yeah, you appreciated I mean, he, him. He, he, I did. I mean, I think we all did. He was, could be at times mercurial because he was very passionate about things he believed in and let you, and, and would let you know that. Right. <laughs> and in right. Non-quiet ways. <laughs> right. Um, but he, you know, he was a mensch. Um, on you know when things got personal, he, he understood things and and was and was you know sort of Uncle Dave as we like to say. Oh, that's so awesome. So he was um, exceptional. Uh, I think we'll go down as one of the great sports leaders of all time. Wow. And again, you know, for somebody like me to have the opportunity to be uh, kind of at his elbow was um, was really a big contributing factor in in how I approach now my work in at the Big East and elsewhere. Right. Well, and it's neat to hear, I mean, you know, because you, you, obviously you stepped away from the WNBA in 05, and you've had multiple careers, obviously, within the industry. But, you know, one question I would have for you is, there's so many people out there that are maybe doing jobs that they like, but there's something else that, that's calling them that they want to do more of, or they want to make a change, or they want to shift. And making those kinds of changes often with our careers is so hard. What advice would you give people who are maybe a little afraid, a little afraid to make make a change? Um, I, I, I think you have to just listen really hard to, to yourself. I mean, I'll, I'll use my example of stepping away from the WNBA. Very hard decision. It was a dream job for me. Um, I, I mean, it was um, the opportunity of a lifetime, really. And it got real hard after the beginning as things settled down and, and we got into the business of selling and some of the numbers started to fall off. But it was truly, um, uh, you know, the job of a lifetime. But it was, it just was exhausting for me. My my kids at that time, I had, I have two daughters. When the WNBA launched, they were three and one. Um, my husband uh, was a partner at a Wall Street law firm, and we were just always running. I mean, it was just um, a high wire act for us. And I mean, eventually, I just ran out of steam, to be honest. Mm -hmm. You know, I just couldn't keep it up. Sure. And I didn't want to go into David and, and Russ and say, hey, can I do this part-time? It wasn't <laughs> right. that kind of a job. It was sort of all or nothing, and so I made the decision to step away. I did it after eight years of, of running the league, and then, as I said, the two or so beforehand. So it was about a decade of work. Um, and um, I just knew. I mean, it was just me, you know, my, my inner self saying, right. you got to step away. Right. And a lot of it had to do with my children and wanting to spend time with them and not wanting regrets about that. Um, so I didn't have a plan in mind when I left, but things started to come to me. The chance to lead USA Basketball as board chair, the opportunity to serve on the FIBA board, teaching at Columbia. I, I was in on the early stages of ESPNW, writing some columns, helping them with their advisory work, um, serving on other boards. And, you know, before long, I mean, I had a portfolio of eight or ten really cool things, um, including some in college sports. So I was busy and involved, and but it was sort of more on my own terms, so I could, you know, be home for dinner when my kids were home from school, and I could manage to travel. 
Yeah. Um, but it was a big risk to leave the WNBA because I, I think at the back of my mind knew in some way that getting back on, if I wanted to do that, would probably not be all that easy. And it and it and it really, you know, it happened with the Big East. But um, but I think that is a risk that people who step out step away from something, they have to come to grips with the possibility that getting back into it. Um, or making a change and hoping that the change is better than what you left. Right, <laughs> you know? right, right. You have to have a level of confidence about that, and that's very personal to everybody. Sure. And changes are made for different reasons. It could be money, it could be geography, it could be something personal, it could be something professional. But what? So that was that drove it for me, and I, I mean, I'm very lucky that things have turned out for me the way they have. And um, I think, frankly, I'll just close this point by saying I think I'm a better leader having left the WNBA and having done some of the things that I did when I left. Right. I don't think I would be able to lead now without having had those experiences also. Wow. Well, and I'm sort of hearing you say, you know, really listen to yourself and, and that sort of the people maybe around you that you're closest to, because I'm sure I'm just making assumptions, but I would assume that the world around you was like, you're leading the WNBA. I mean, this is an unbelievable, what are you thinking, right? Because the world would tell you that's a dream job. But you're looking at those little kids growing up going, yeah, but, yeah, but I'm not sure how, I can only do this once. Um, it, it was, yeah, it was It was just that. I mean, um, you know, and I gave David and Russ plenty of lead time on it. They, to be candid, they didn't believe me. <laughs> right. <laughs> um, yeah, this is, I'm serious. Um, right, <laughs> but but and and a lot of it, I would say, was, was about my daughters. The funny thing is, when I told them, who who were at that point, um, you know, sort of twelve and ten, that I was leaving the WNBA, I expected, you know, high fives and cartwheels, and instead they were they just stared at me uh-huh. <laughs> and couldn't believe it because, you know, that was all they knew. Sure, was sure. Going to work every day, and my oldest was you know kind of glaring at me, saying. You know, what do you think you're going to do? Stay home and clean. And she was a little bit snippy about it, but um, we laugh about it now because I do ask them, "Hey, are you got? Were you guys serious? You didn't want me to leave my job?" And they said, "No, we're really happy you did." And and those were some of the best years I had I with my girls. Were when I left and I could be on more of their schedule than them being on my schedule. Sure. So I would say, when you said, what's the hardest part of this? I'd say that just juggling, particularly if you have listeners who have families you know, male or female leaders, that's the hardest part of this. Sure. Meeting jobs sometimes is easy compared to, okay, you know, having the energy to do the second shift when you get home. Now, of course, you have the third shift. Sure. Because you come home and then you do, you know, your time with your kids and then you go back on email at sure. 10 o'clock at night. Sure. Um, so that to me is really what makes this work tougher. And then the travel, because a lot of my travel was weekend travel, WNBA at a summer season, so all my kids were off from school. Wow, I was at my he- at my, I was at my busiest, and so again, how you work through that with your husband and wife, partner, your n- support network is very personal, and I don't have a formula for it. But you need you need a support system to make all of those parts of your life fit together. Sure, sure. Well, I feel really connected to what you just said because I you know I was a sports agent for almost twenty years and felt that same pull and watching these three girls of ours grow up and feeling like I was missing things and. And so I feel really connected to what you just said because I walked away and and started my own business and and it was it, it's scary right but you look at yeah, those sure. in the eyes of those girls because we have three too so and your husband and you go gal you know what I mean and and this is the right thing to do but it's hard to do but it, it I think what what I love about what you're saying is trust yourself right and listen to your heart and listen to yourself and then have the courage. To have the difficult conversation with the Davids in your own life to make that shift. That, that's it, 100%. I mean, you, 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 put it, you put it well. And again, you have to, you know, you have to take chances. And I think one thing I've learned, and I tell my daughters this all the time, is life isn't always a straight line. You know, sometimes you zig and you zag. And I didn't get my, my NBA job. That was a dream job. When I started out in pro basketball in 1988, I had been on Wall Street for a couple of years, was dying to get into sports, and uh, a, a, um, a vacancy opened up at the NBA in the legal department, and uh, I wound up getting that job. But I didn't get that job right away either. I mean, that job was um, seven years out of college, uh, it was a couple of years out of law, three years out of law school, 
Um, there was some zigging and zagging there, you know. <laughs> right, sure. Learning other things, doing other things. Sure. Um, and then I kind of got my in a, myself in a position for that one to happen. But, I mean, I tell my daughters this all the time, and I tell any, any young person who calls me for career advice, I say, just don't be afraid to zig and zag. Right. Um, you know, you don't have to get a job and then stay there for 40 years. I mean, that was your grandfather, you know, probably not your grandmother, but it was mm. probably your grandfather. Um, you know, but that doesn't have to be you, and take advantage of, of opportunities. And it may be a little risky sounding or seeming, but sometimes those are exactly the jobs that get you an experience that you wouldn't have had or a skill set that you might not have been able to cultivate or, more importantly, relationships sure. that you would never have forged that at the end can really come back and, and help you in, in important ways. Right, right. So you just have to have your words. You have to have the courage to make that step. Sure, sure. Wow. Well, so, I mean, Val, I could talk to you for hours. And um, one day when I'm in New York, I'm going to beg you for a cup of coffee. So... Uh, if you're in great. town, maybe we'll do it. So we end all our podcast with, we call it rapid fire. So I'm going to just throw some questions at you real quick. And uh, I just want you to answer kind of what comes up for you. Does that sound good? Sure. Happy to try. All right. <laughs> all right. Um, so one word to describe yourself. Um, intense. What, what is one word you think others would use to describe you? Serious. Biggest fear. I, I would say, you know, losing my family. All right. What about your favorite book? Cold Mountain. Ooh, I'm going to have to go get that. I haven't heard of that. Favorite social media channel? This is easy because I'm not on social media. So I'm going to, like, do N.A. on that one. <laughs> I am really? not. That's on my to-do okay. list. Okay. So you don't access it or use for it for information? The, yeah. That's a to-do okay. list. Okay. <laughs> what is one thing people don't know about you? Um, uh, I'm an animal lover. Hmm. Biggest pet peeve, speaking of pets. Not getting to the point. Nice, life motto. 90% of life is showing up. Nice, all right. Well, Val, thank you so much for taking time to do this. You are um, an inspiration to me, and I know so many other women out there, so thanks for guiding the way for so many of us. Oh, Mom, you're too kind. I appreciate that, and I, you know, I think uh, anybody listening here, they, they, everybody can offer something here to the journey, particularly of women in sports. So I appreciate your interest. Great talking to you too, and hopefully uh, we can catch up in person. Thanks as always for listening. And if you missed an episode, you can listen to previous episodes on iTunes or on MollyFletcher.com. Until next time, stay curious and be a game changer.